Rachel Goldman Miller, a native of France, born to Jewish Polish parents in 1933, lost 93 family members in the Holocaust. She lost her son Mark to AIDS. She lost her husband Milton after 47 years of marriage. In 1995, Miller was diagnosed with breast cancer, yet she prevails. Rachel is now 84 years old and lives in St. Louis. She was one of the children in hiding, a Jewish child whose parents sent them away from home to pass as non-Jews and live openly or live clandestinely, such as in attics or cellars. These children, posing as Christians, had to conceal their Jewish identity, fearing the prying eyes of neighbors, the police, and others. Miller's life was spared. Having wished she wasn't a Jew when she was a child, she now embraces and practices her Jewish faith. As for her, the frequent talks she gives, I promised myself when the war was over, I would speak up. We are honored to have her with us today to tell her story. Please give a warm welcome to Rachel. Thank you for having me. My name is Rachel Goldman Miller, but really in French it's Rachel for Rachel. Goldman is my maiden name and Miller is my married name. I was the youngest of four children and I was the only one that was born in France. My family came from Warsaw, Poland. My father was a barber, my mother was a housewife. I had two brothers, Adolphe and my brother Henri and my sister Sabine. My father came from a family of eight. My mother came from a family of 13. Both of my grandmothers were living at the beginning of the war. They were, a, they were a very family oriented. However, there was a lot of anti-Semitism and they wanted my father to serve in the Polish army. So he decided to move to France and as I mentioned before, they were very family oriented. He had a brother and a sister living there, and my mother had two brothers. So they moved to France, and it must have been quite a shock for my mother, for only one reason. They had a lovely home in Warsaw. My father has his own barber shop, as I mentioned. And now he was working for someone else, plus the fact they were living in a two-room apartment with no running water, and my mother had to go up to the second floor to get water. It must have been very difficult for her. This was in 1932, and I arrived, and I was a surprise in 1933. With that, I'm going to show you some pictures of my family. As I mentioned, this is Warsaw, Poland. This is my Aunt Rose, and you're going to hear an awful lot about her. This is her sister, Eva. This is my paternal grandfather, my paternal grandmother, and this is my oldest brother, Adolf. This is my mother with one of her sisters. This is my mother with one of her sisters, and this is a sister or a brother, uh, I don't know exactly, they must have been dressed for a festival. This was their engagement picture and this is their wedding announcement. They were married in March of 1923. This is Adolphe, my mother, Henri and Sabine. This is my mother's sister, I have a lot of her pictures. She's got to be a favorite somehow. This is my maternal grandmother with Sabine. This is my father, my mother, and this is my mother's brother Aaron, who I did know. However, I don't remember his wife's name or my little cousins over here. She and him. And this is my maternal grandmother, Adolphe, Henri, and Sabine. This is the other picture of my mother, my father, paternal grandmother, Adolphe, Henri, and Sabine. So they arrived in France in 1932. My father, my mother, Adolphe, Henri, Sabine, and this is me right here. This is Sabine and this is me. And when I look at those pictures, I'm really so excited because I adored my sister. And the fact that we shared the same kind of clothes makes me so happy. That, was, that is something that I, when I look at it, it always makes me feel so close to her. I just love it. This is my mother in the country. This is her other brother, Jules. And this is his wife, Fanny, and his name is Michelle, and I don't remember the other little cousins. This looks like a school picture for my brothers, probably when they arrived from Warsaw, Poland, Adolphe and Henri. This is my mother, 
And this is my Aunt Rose. And again, this is a picture in the country. And this is me over here. And this is Sabine. And again, we're dressed alike. Her name is Rachel, and I don't remember his name. As a little girl, I can only remember lots of fun. We used to get together on Saturday night. We were a singing family. We sang in three different languages. We sang in French, we sang in Yiddish, and we sang in Polish. And we would have ice cream, candy, chocolate, and whatever. It was so wonderful to get together with my aunts and uncles and my cousin. I looked forward from one week to the other. Now, this is the Jewish Quarter in Paris, which is called Rue des Rosiers. And uh, prior to the war, it was a very vibrant area. You could buy a needle to a car. Uh, I was in France, uh, I believe the last time it was about five or six years ago. And they're beginning to gentrify the area, but they have a ways to go. It was a Sunday morning, and I was sitting by the buffet. My, husband, my father was cutting my hair. And I heard him say to my mother, it's beginning of doom. Why at the age of seven did it register, but it did. I forgot about it. That was the day that Germany invaded Poland. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty much the same. Nothing changed. In 1940, I heard of this wonderful parade. As a kid, who doesn't want to see a parade? I ran downstairs and I started, I looked at the Germans. They were expressionless. They frightened me so on their horses, on their t in their tanks, in their cars, motorcycles. I ran upstairs and I kept saying, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, my parents said to me. What happened to you? I said, I'm afraid. And they kept saying, oh, that's all I kept saying. Did anybody hurt you? Did you fall down? What happened? All I kept saying, I was afraid. I had very good reasons to be afraid because that was the beginning of doom for all of us. My father did not serve in the Polish army, but wound up serving in the, I mean, in the Polish army and wound up serving in the French army. This was the day of doom. This is the Champs-Élysées, and this is Lac de Triomphe, and this is where the German soldiers were walking. This is not the street where I lived, but uh, you can see the soldiers walking by, and for Hitler to be able to drive through Lac de Triomphe must have been total ecstasy, because they lost World War I. I don't know if you're familiar with the Versailles Treaty, and I'm not going to go into it, but um, this was quite a coup for him to be able to now take over and, and conquer all of Europe. It was August of 1941, a very beautiful day. Let me tell you about our building. We had two black double doors, and within the black double door, there's a courtyard in the shape of a U. And we lived in building number A, and it went B, C, so forth and so on. With that, there was a lot of commotion in the yard. German soldiers, SS, French police. My, our neighbor, Monsieur Martin, that lived across the way, came knocking at the door and said, Monsieur Goldman, please come with me. They're picking up the Jews and taking them to a labor camp. My father did not question it. He picked up a suitcase and started to walk across the yard when Monsieur Maurice, in building number C, this is the strap that was around his suitcase. When Monsieur Maurice in building number C saw him trying to hide and told the French police that my father was trying to get away. They came upstairs looking for my two brothers. Adolphe was now 18 and my youngest brother was now 16. The reason I told you we had no running water is because we had one of these big tubs my mother hid my two brothers under the bed. I'm sure the inspector that came up must have seen them, but decided not to see them. So on that day, my father was taken away. His brother, Leon, was taken away. And my aunt Rose's husband was taken away. And he was actually taken away by mistake. Why do I say that? Uh, Marshal Pétain, who was then the prime minister, made a deal with Hitler that he can take all the foreign Jews, uh, Russians, Lithuanians, Hungarians, Poles, so forth and so on, but he was to leave the French Jews alone. My aunt Rose, my uncle Salomon, was born in a place called Rancy, 
which is about 100 kilometers outside of Paris. As I mentioned before, we were very family oriented. Only rich people in those days had telephones. Only rich people in those days are cars. So we all, we all lived within walking distance. So my uncle heard what was going on. He started walking towards our house. And he was stopped in the street and they was asked, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to visit my family. What's your name? And he said, Salomon Yorkovich. He too was taken on that day. I don't have to tell you there was no more Saturday get-togethers. But this is a letter from my uncle, and he was actually taken to the place where he was born, which is Trasi, which became a holding camp. And this is where he wrote, Dear wife and daughter, I received your card. I'm very happy to hear good news, new means and from, from you. And over here mentions my father right here, also received a letter from his wife and a package of nourriture, which is food, which he needed very desperately. And he's asking for all kinds of things because he's got a, he mentions that he has a cold right here, a room right here. He mentions he has a cold. And he's asking for soap, for laundry, soap for bathing. He's asking for a little knife. He's asking for a comb. He's asking for candy. And most of all, he's asking for cigarettes. He was a smoker. I don't know how my mother or my aunt were able to get them out of the camp, but they did. This was in December of 1941. All I know is that they were taken to L'Hôpital Tonneau, which is on the right bank of Paris, and they had major surgery there and did very, very well. Now Anouida came out. Only the French Jews could stay in that hospital. All the others had to be moved to the right bank of Paris, which was the Rothschild Hospital, and there my father was, that's where my father went. I don't know what he developed. Anyway, the only good thing about it is that we were allowed to see him three hours a week. So one day my mother would go, another time she would take my two brothers, another time she would take my sister and I. We got there on the 28th of December. I was so excited. He was coming back January 1st. As far as I was concerned, things would be back to normal. We'd have our get-togethers again, and everything would be wonderful. <laughs> My mother went to see him on December 30th. She got there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. My father told her that at 10 o'clock in the morning, he had been injected with something, and he became very sick, and he died in her arms at 2 o'clock, Tuesday, December 30th, 1941. My uncle, who was at L'Hôpital Tonneau on the right bank of Paris, told my Aunt Rose that at 10 o'clock in the morning, he had been injected with something, and he died in her arms at 2 o'clock, Tuesday, December 1941. We couldn't figure out how one knew that the other one had died. We soon found out. They were both experimented upon. They were the first Jews to die under the German occupation. They had a funeral of 1,500 people. We did not know 1,500 people. This is their grave. The coffin holds about 30 graves, and they're right here, my, aunt, my father and my uncle, right over there. This is a picture of my Aunt Rose and me just before I left for the United States. And this is my cousin, Arlette. This is my uncle's sister, Suzanne, and his niece, Denise. And this is me and Arlette. My house was really, really very sad. But I must tell you something. A lot of people think that the Jews went without fighting. And with that, I have to change, because that is Totally, totally erroneous. Now, this is my brother Adolf now. He's 18 years old plus. He was born April 20th. His birthday was last, would have been last week. This is my cousin Elaine. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She's my hero. She was taken prisoner as a Christian. She was carrying 17 false identification cards and 17 guns that she was bringing to the underground. If I take away those four letters, A and C, E, you're left with the word resist, which means to fight back. And that's exactly what it is. It's called the resistance fighters. She was tortured for three 
solid days. She never revealed where she was bringing the papers or the gun. She survived. I spoke to her about 10 days ago. And uh, she's had a very, very difficult night all of her life. Jean Lamberger, who was also part of the group. By the way, my brother Henri was part of the group, but I don't have a picture of him. In the March of the Living, when the war was coming to an end, the Germans took, I call them skeletons, because that's what they were, skeletons, 100,000 skeletons towards Germany. This was in the month of January, and they marched till the, month of, till the end of March, and 10,000 survived. Jean was one of them, and he was decorated by Prime Minister Mitterrand. This is my brother Adolf over here. I don't know who the other gentlemen are. This is a picture of my Aunt Rose. This is a picture of Olive when she was little, her daughter and her over here. And this is the last picture of Sabine and I, and as you can see, we dressed alike. She was very beautiful. She had blonde hair and brown eyes, and she had a pockmark right here. I still remember it. So, my mother, school was coming to an end, and my mother said to me, Rachel, I'm going to send you to the country. I was so excited. I wanted to be happy. I wanted to have everything I had before. My house was so sad. The night that I was supposed to leave, my mother gave me a new name. She called me Christine, and she said, you are not to tell anyone that you're Jewish. Had I ever told a lie, I would have been punished. But here my mother is telling me to get a new name and not to tell anyone that I'm Jewish. Even at the age of nine, I understood what it was that I should be afraid of. Sabine, my sister, was supposed to join me. But my Aunt Rose promised her a handbag. So she was not, she, her birthday was July the 15th. I was leaving July the 13th with my friend Cecile, and Sabine would join us on the 18th. I got to the camp, to the uh, farm. It was exactly what I wanted it to be. All the kids were playing and they were singing and so forth and for a day and a half. Kids came up and they started to talk about this big raid that they're going to have in Paris. I became very frightened. I started to cry and I went into my bed. And I forgot all about it. On the 18th, I went to the bus, thinking to take off my sister Sabine. Instead, Cecile's mother got off the bus. And I said to her, where's Sabine? She said, oh, she went shopping. I said, shopping? Why would she go shopping when she's supposed to be here? I asked all kinds of questions. We started to walk towards the farm. And when we got there, what seemed like an eternity, I ran in and I said, if you don't tell me what happened to my family, I'm going to run away to Paris. So they told me that on July the 16th, they picked up my mother, my brother Adolphe, my brother Henri, and my sister Sabine. I was very angry at my mother. My mother did not love me. Why did she send me away? Why did she not keep me with her? My mother loved me very much. Had she kept me with her, I would not be standing here today telling you my story. My mother saved my life. It must have been such a difficult thing for her to do, to send her child away. As a parent, I can understand that now. But who's going to take care of me? I'm under an assumed name. I'm on a farm. What's going to happen to me? I'm nine years old. I was very, very frightened. Three and a half weeks later, I got a letter from my Aunt Rose who told me she was in hiding with my cousin Arlette. And as soon as it would be safe, she would take me back to Paris. Now Anita came out. Anyone hiding a Jewish child, if you'll report them to the police, they'll give you 300 francs. This woman, whose name I do not remember, but bless her soul, every time I tell my story, wrote a letter to my aunt, my aunt asking her permission whether or not she should report me to the police. She did not, and my aunt sent her the 300 francs. So as a result, I was saved twice, once by my mother and once by this farmer whose soul I blessed. 
things quieted down, quieted it down, and man brought me back to Paris. When I got back to Paris, the first thing I wanted to do was to go to the place, to my house where we lived. That was the day that they were looting our apartment. I asked permission if I could go upstairs to get the pictures. I was nine years old. Sabine was supposed to bring my doll, but I asked Madame Thiel if she bought my doll. Of course, she didn't know that she, Sabine was supposed to bring my doll. I did not take my doll. I just took the pictures and walked out of my apartment, and that was the last time I was there. I went to live with my Aunt Rose, and now Anita came out. Anyone over the age of six had to wear the Star of David. It's two triangles, yellow and black, and it says Jew. In French, it's Juif, J-U-I-F. What did that mean? It meant that we had a curfew of 8 o'clock at night. It meant that we had grocery shopping between the hours of 3 and 4. It meant that sometimes I could go to school. It meant that sometimes my aunt could go to work. We were not allowed to have any kind of amenities. My aunt was rich by my standard. She had cold running water, and she had a radio. They took away the radio. My little cousin had a tricycle. She was three and a half years old. We had to turn in the tricycle. Did you ever see black potatoes? Everything in the food was black. To this day, I will not eat a banana that has a brown spot on it. Because during the war, the bananas were dried bananas, and they looked like feces. That's just what they looked like. Soap was black, bread was black, milk looked like chalk water. To this day, I don't drink any milk. And as I mentioned, everything was black. It was very cold this particular winter. My aunt had, as I mentioned, she was rich. Her bedroom had a radiator in it. And from the cold, the walls used to sweat, and water actually came down. So we slept in the kitchen because there was a stove. We slept on the kitchen table. And my aunt slept on, a, on some, two chairs. She was sick, and I went online, and I went on, um, online to uh, get some, an apple for her. She had pleurisy. It was five minutes to four, and this woman butt herself in front of me. And I gently tapped her, and I said, excuse me, madam, I said, I've been waiting here. And she looked at my star that said Jew. She said, you filthy little Jew, you have the audacity to tell me that I have been waiting online over here. I'm going to call the Germans, they're going to take you away. And the dogs, they walked around with shepherds who were ready to attack at any moment. I started to bread, and I was, I was crying, I was practically on my knees. By the time it was my turn, it was too late. I started to walk towards my aunt's house. I was crying all the way, and I promised myself when the war would be over, I would speak. I couldn't get that piece of fruit for her. We were in a cellar. That's not, I'm not talking about a basement. There's a difference between a basement and a cellar. A, pa a basement is where you can still have a playroom and so forth and so on. A cellar is pitch black. We had rats running around us for three, five and a half days. To this day, I would go ballistic when I see a mouse. We had to walk around with these gas masks that smelled so terrible in case there was an air raid, which there were some, quite a few. I went to bed till I was 13 and a half. I was afraid of the dark till I was 50. I was afraid of dogs till I was 40, and I'm still very cautious, depending upon what the dog looks like. When I was changing identity, when I was in hiding, 
My name was Christine. When I lived with my aunt, I wore the star and I was Rachel. I was in a convent for a year and a half. I was almost baptized and had my first communion. My aunt took us out because the mother superior insisted that I be baptized and have my first communion. And my aunt would not allow her to do that because she didn't know at the time what would happen to my family. Oh, I forgot to tell you something about what happened to my family. When they were taken on July the 16th, they were taken to a place which would be con comparable to any convention center. It's called Val d'Hiver. 17,500 people were taken. They had six bathrooms, three of which faced the street. So they closed it off because they didn't want people to see what was going on and only left three bathrooms for 17,500 people. You're talking about babies and people up to the age, let's say, 100. They were there for five and a half days without sanitation, without food. Of course, there was no air conditioning in those days, and even if there was, they would have not used it without water, without anything. From there, they were taking what is called a holding camp, and they were taking to a place called PTV, which is about 250 kilometers outside of Paris. There, a German soldier fell in love with Sabine. He wanted to marry her. As I mentioned before, she was very beautiful and very, very nice, inside and outside brought out three letters. He came knocking at our door. He was in civilian clothes. And the first letter is imprinted in my brain, parts of it anyway. She writes of how they shaved my mother's beautiful black hair and my brother's blonde hair and Ari's hair and hers. She's dirty, she's sick, and they tattooed her. He brought out three letters, and by the time my aunt gave him permission to marry her, she was on a convoy to Auschwitz, and that was the last time I heard from my family. We didn't know what was happening. They were taking people. What were they doing with them? Where were they sending them? What, what was going on? We didn't know. You couldn't get friendly with anybody because you didn't know whether they were going to be there today or whether they were going to be there tomorrow. And you were afraid to talk to anybody. As a child, I was living in constant fear. When I was living with my aunt, I was afraid they would take me away. When I was in hiding, I was afraid they'd find out I was Jewish and they'd take me away. So it was always, always being afraid. It's hard to believe that they would take all these people and babies. What would they do with babies? Where would they put them? and older people that could hardly walk, people that were sick. My aunt's in-laws were at the same hospital that my, father, that my father was at. And we went to see her, we went to see them, rather. And the day we went to see them, that was the day that they were taking him out of the hospital, and they were stacking them in a van like dirty laundry, one on top of the other. The only one that could survive would be the one that was on top. Had they left them to die, just pulled the plug, they would have died with dignity, but they couldn't do that. It went on and it went on and it went on. My aunt was getting very, very nervous because the war was going on and they were taking older, they killed 93,000 Jews in France. 93,000 Jews. What was going to happen to us? She was getting to the point where she was getting very nervous that things were happening and might be happening to us. So she heard. By the way, I kept changing identity, as I mentioned before. In the last place, it was a pension where you go to somebody's house and they would take care of the children. I had lice because of malnutrition. and. 
I kept thinking, my brothers were strong. My sister was beautiful. Who would want to hurt somebody that is so nice and so beautiful? Of course she'd come back. My mother was not well. So I wasn't sure about my mother, but I always had hopes about my brother and my sister. June 6th, 1944. Not the beginning of the end, but a wonderful, wonderful day. That was the day that America, with the Australia and the British, bombed the Normandy, the Normandy invasion, June 6, 1944. We were so excited, but we were still so frightened till the very last day, till Hitler signed the paper, they were taking Jews. They were taking them to the camps and they couldn't even tattoo them because they didn't have the, the people to tattoo them. The people that actually survived, most of them, are the ones that were taken very late in 1944. Anyone that was taken before 1944, 40, 42 and 43, very, very, you could almost count them on your hand. That's how many survived. The war was, over, was coming to an end, and my aunt heard about this Jewish camp. And she put my cousin and I into this camp because, as I mentioned, till the very last day, they were still taking Jews, and she was afraid. So let's show you some pictures, the second one. This is the orphanage that I was in. This is me over here. This is me over here. And this is all that. And as you can see, we're in a circle and dancing. I'm not, I'm not in any of these. Three parents came back. Not three sets of parents, but three parents came back from this orphanage. By the way, the school that I went to, school started from age 6 to age 10. 1,259 girls, because it was a girl's school, were murdered. 1,259 school children were murdered. So a soldier was passing by, and he heard the children playing. He happened to be Jewish, and he came in, and I was reciting a Jewish poem. The director asked me to come in and, and recite it, and Harry asked permission if he could bring in the base. 300 American soldiers and wax came in and they bought us ice cream and chocolate and so forth. And they bought us grapefruits and oranges. We knew how to eat oranges. By the way, one Christmas, my cousin and I had one orange for our present. One Christmas during the war. One orange. That was our gift. And we ate the gray food. We started to eat it with the skin. We didn't know how to eat it. We didn't like it very much, I have to tell you. Harry became very attached to me, and I had lost my father, and he wanted to bring me to the United States. I became very attached to him. And there were two other soldiers that wanted to bring me to the United States, but Harry seemed to be the favorite one. Anyway, the good thing that Harry did, he brought me to the United States. That was a good thing. For nine months that I lived with Harry and his wife, he molested me. I was in five different foster homes until I got married. I married a very nice gentleman with a lovely family who became my family. This is my Aunt Rose, this is me, and that's all. And by the way, this coat that I'm wearing is a khaki army blanket that was dyed brown. That's what I was wearing. This is Arlette and I. You can see I'm a little girl. I was 11 and a half years old. This is one of the nurses, Malvina. This is me, and that's Arlette. This is 1947, when I first still living with Harry in his house. You can see he's in his army uniform. This is my passport picture. This is my cousin, Lily. She is the younger sister of my cousin, the one that I call my hero. She committed suicide. She had a terrible, terrible life. And this is me, and I don't, I'm terrible with name. I don't remember this woman. When the war was over, the Russians liberated Auschwitz. 
and they took all the archives with them. When the wall came down, the International Red Cross asked permission to go in and get some of the archives that they had taken out. And these are documents about my family. I have been searching all of my life, trying to find, trying to find out what happened to my family. And this is for Goldman Khaja. That's for my mother. She was born 1901 in Paris. This is our address, Paris, to Camp PTVA, Uden to concentration camp in August on the 6th and 17th of August, 1942. This is for Adolf Goldman Abraham. He was born April 20th, 1924, to Newton Khaja Ney Rabinovich, Paris 11th Rue du Faubourg Saint Antoine de Saint to Camp PTVA U. The Germans had different names for Jews, by the way. To concentration camp on Auschwitz on the 30th, 31st July 1942, that day on the 17th of October 1942 at 9.30 p.m., cause of death, and the riders with bodily weakness. What they did, they couldn't put down that they were starved to death. Do you know how many calories a day they were allowed to eat? 180 calories a day. That's not even a glass of milk. They used to go to work between 4 and 6 in the morning and work till 10 o'clock at night. How can you survive with 180 calories a day? For how long can you survive with 180 calories a day? So I don't know whether or not, and endoritis with bodily weakness, I don't know if I said, if I mentioned it, they'd open up a medical book and whatever sounded right, that's what they put down on the death certificate. It's for Henri Hirsch. He was born August 29, 1926, in Warsaw, to Natal Raja Rabinovich, Paris 11th, Faubourg Saint Antoine de Saint 75, to Camp Pitivier Yud, concentration camp on Auschwitz on the 30th, 31st of July, 1942, died there on the 5th of January, 1943, at 4.25 p.m., cause of death, myocardial weakness. I'm only sorry that he lived longer than my brother and had to suffer. What I remember about him, I remember the least about him, but it was swing, and he had metal on his, metal on his shoes. And when he'd go up the steps, you could hear him tapping with his shoes, with his feet. That's what I remember about him. He was a sweetheart. This is for Sabine. She was born July 15th, 1929. This is incorrect. You know she was born in Warsaw, Paris 275, Faubourg Saint-Antoine, to Camp PTV, a Juden, concentration camp on the 19th of August, 1942. She was the last one to go to Auschwitz. Now, the thing that you don't see about, about my mother and Sabine is that when they arrived at the camp, by the way, it says, Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes you free. They used to have an orchestra playing Beethoven and the dogs were ready to attack at any moment, but they had to have the orchestra playing. They didn't want people to get nervous and run away, so that's why they had the music. So when they arrived, they had an itinerary. I, actually, it's, I call it a bill of lading. They grouped them by country. They grouped them by gender. They grouped them by age. If you were 16, to 40, and you were tall, let's say you would go to the right. That meant that you went to work. If you were 16 and under, and 40 and over, and after traveling and being in a holding camp for five and a half days, and traveling for two days, what condition could you be? Many of them died when they opened up the cattle cars. They were already dead bodies standing there. And those that didn't, and looked like they were ready to die, they would send them to the, let's say, to the left side. And there they would, again, have the orchestra playing and tell them that they were to take showers. They would tell them to get undressed and tie their shoes together so when they come out, they would find their clothes and their shoes. They would put them in the gas chambers, drop the gas pellets, and when they came out, they would have people go through their body cavities to make sure that there was no money, no gold or diamonds. 
and then they would put him into the crematorium. I went to visit several camps, and one camp that I went to visit, which to me was the worst of them all, is Madonic, it's in Poland. The commandant had his bath tub at the end of this auditorium, and let's say this is the crematorium over here. He would take his bath while the crematorium was burning. That was his spa. It was unbelievable. It was horrific. This is my oldest son, Neil. He is an attorney, but he's retired, and he was a prosecutor, and he's retired. This is my husband, and he died on the same day as my father, December 30th, 1997. This is my daughter-in-law, Marcy, and she's also an attorney, and she's also retired. This is my oldest granddaughter, Jenna, who is waiting to hear from the bar in New York, and hopefully she passed it. This is my youngest granddaughter, Julia, who is an art history major, cannot find a job, so she's bartending. This is me, and this is my son, Mark, who is also an attorney. He was gay, and he died of AIDS. He was a graduate of Princeton and Yale. This is Mark before he was sick. This is a bar mitzvah, and it's Isaac's bar mitzvah right here. This is my husband. He's sick over here because he's not wearing his glasses, and that's my son, Neil and Marcy, and I'm wearing the red ribbon for Mark. And those are my grandchildren. I wanted to find out what it was like to be in the camp, so I, about 15, 17 years ago, I did what is called the March of the Living, and I went to Warsaw. This is the street where my parents would have been married, and this is approximately the building where they would have, where the building would have been. The thing that's interesting, you see the word, it says Miller's Art, right on top of the building. This is in Warsaw, Poland, which was very interesting. The Germans burnt down the whole city because the Warsaw Ghetto was going on and they were fighting basically with their bare hands and they couldn't stop him from fighting. The only way they could stop them from fighting was to burn down the city. So the whole city of Warsaw was totally destroyed. This is a slumber party. We never had a slumber party, never had birthdays. So we decided to have one. We lost Trudy over here. Everybody else is here and that's me over here. And that's my story. Give me your name. My name is Freedom. Freedom? Freedom? Yes. Okay. Right. Nice to meet you, Freedom. Nice to meet you. Um, my question was on the on the document about Sabine, I never saw any like cause of death. Was she under the age of sixteen, so she went to the left per se? That's correct. She went to the gas chambers. Oh, that's that's nice. correct. And that's what happened to my mother. Thank you for saying asking that question. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Can you come closer? I'm Owen. Uh, What's your name? Owen. Hi, nice to meet you, Owen. Um, when you were little, didn't you have like toys? Like children's when toys? I did, I did have a doll. That was about the only toy I had. Oh, wow. We were very poor. Yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> I mean, like, that would be a horrible, a horrible life to live in. And it wasn't a horrible life. It was really, when I lived with my family, it was a wonderful life. I was very happy. I wish I could still have it. And toys are not, are things. Love is more important and family is more important. That is true. Yes? What's your name, dear? Noah. I'm sorry? Noah. Noah? Nice to meet you. What was it like at the Warsaw camp, the practice camp? You mean when I went to Warsaw? Yeah. I was not in the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, I went to see it after it was long, long uh, past. The Warsaw ghetto happened in 1943. Dang. And I went, I was there about 17 years ago, which would have been about 2000, year 2000. 
so it was past, it was way past. But they did burn the whole city. What's your name? Robin. What? Robin. Robin. Hi, Robin. When you were in hiding, how many children were actually living in the home where you're hiding from? Well, it was different, and different home, different times when I was in hiding. Sometimes there were ten children. Sometimes it was only my cousin and I. It all depended. It was different times. You want to give me your name? My name is Levi. But, um, Levi? Levi. Levi. Mm -hmm. But were some of those experiences, like whenever you're going through those losses, uh, were they real sad or did you have to move on and try to continue? They were very sad. All the losses are very, very, they're very painful. And it's very hard to live through them. But for some miracle, I don't know what it is, I'm still here. So I guess I am a survivor. Oh yeah, it was nice meeting you. It's nice to meet you too. Thank you, Levi. Yes. You look like a teacher. I'm a teacher. <laughs> you want, you want to no, you can. Okay. I often have students ask why didn't, what were the rules put in place that kept Jews from just leaving, just like the slaves? So what <coughs> precautions had they already thought of the Germans so that you couldn't just take the star off, you couldn't just get out of the country? Well, as a child, I couldn't very well do that, but I will share a story with you. I had a boyfriend, and he was not Jewish. And uh, he asked me to go to the movies. And he only had enough money for him and for me. He didn't have enough money for my cousin. So we went to the movies. I don't remember what movie we saw. And we bought our little lollipop. In the interim, there was an air raid, and we had to get out of the... And I, what I did is I took my coat and reversed the lining so you couldn't see the star, which, of course, not only did I put myself in danger, but I would have put my aunt and my cousin, and even this boy, André, I would have put him in, I would have put him in danger. But I did that. Of course, I was 10 years old, and... Uh, when my aunt saw me, I was punished, and she was right in this time to punish. My aunt was very abusive, she, um, physically and mentally. But that time I deserved to be punished, because I really put out the whole family in danger. But I guess I had that feeling of wanting to escape, so that's what you're talking about, that's what I did. Yes. What's your name? Emma. Hi, Emma. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask if you were able to get in contact with any of the other orphans from your childhood since you went to America. Unfortunately not. We all went our own separate ways, and I guess we all had our own problems, and mm -hmm. I've never... There was somebody I wanted to contact, uh, somebody from the orphanage, but I've never done it. I should try it on the Internet, but I don't... I mean, I'm 84, I'm sure he's going to be 84 too, so who knows whether he's still alive and where he is, so I don't know. But I'll try. Thank you, Emma. What is your name? Kedrick. Kedrick, nice to meet you. So, um, when, when you were in the holes, um, how many people were in there with you? When we were in the holes? Yeah. We were just by ourselves that time. Oh. Sometimes we were with other people, but that time we were by ourselves. Okay. You mean when the rats were running around me? No, I mean like when you're outside and... Oh, there were a lot of people. Oh. A lot of people. In one hole? Yes. Okay. I was just want to get clear. Yeah. What's your name? Um, Hannah. Hannah. Um, is your son still alive? I don't think you mentioned it. My son, Neil, is still yes. alive, yes. He just came back from Spain with his wife, and they had a wonderful trip. I spoke to him this morning before I came here. Thank God. I couldn't stand it. That would be much too much. It's nice meeting you. Nice to meet you too, Hannah. I got a question. What happens if you were caught um, outside curfew? They would send you away, or they would shoot you, one or the other. You, you knew that? Mm-hmm. 
Was there anything that you or your family did to like keep your hopes up or keep or give you hope? I always had the, what's your name? Taylor. Uh, nice to meet you, Taylor. I always had the hope when uh, my family was taken away that my brothers and my sister would survive. I wanted them, I particularly wanted my sister to survive. She was the, cl I just adored her. I miss her still. She probably is the person I miss the most. How many different languages do you speak since? Like you uh, I speak three, langu three and a half languages. I speak English, I speak French, I speak Yiddish, and a little bit of Spanish. Thank you for asking. What's the doll up there? Oh, I could give, come over here. I'm going to give you a hug for asking. I was hoping somebody was going to ask me. Thank you. Thank you for asking. When I was in hiding, what was my name? Christine. Right, thank you. Do you remember who I went away with? My friend Cecile, this doll, I, a friend of mine wrote a play about Mark and I. It's called Beyond Me. And we went to Paris. And at the end of the day, I went to this flea market and I bought myself this doll because my doll didn't look like this at all. And she was in a box and a friend of mine asked me, I told my friend, I said, Carol, I bought myself a doll. She says, bring her. So I bought her, so somebody looked, took the tag over and said, Christine Cecile. So as a result, she is so important, she comes with me. So thank you for asking. There is something I want to read you. It's a young lady in St. Louis who wrote, uh, who wrote something about her experience at, after being at the Holocaust Museum. And I think it tells an awful lot. It's called, Am I Responsible? I lead friends into the chambers. I bring neighbors into camp. I saw two victims' belongings. Am I responsible? I never meant to be a bringer of death. Yet here I am, aiding the Nazis, in hope of a crumb of bread and another breath of life. Am I responsible? I was forced to come here, and when I was faced with the screen green mist, I knew I was staring in the eyes of death. So I cracked. I told them I would do whatever they wanted. I said I would work, and I followed their orders. Am I responsible? I like to think it is not my fault, but when I lock the door, I know the fog is enveloping innocent lives because of me. Am I responsible? But I do not want to be. I want to save them. I want to unlock the door. But all I do is cover my ears to block out the screams. Seven year, the seventh grader wrote this. I thought it was pretty powerful and deserves to be read. Again, I want to thank you, all of you. I want to thank your principal, your teachers, for bringing you here. I want to thank Sandy Deal for making it all possible. Thank you very much.